everyone. We're continuing our digestive system lectures with the stomach. So we've gone through the oral cavity, the pharynx, and the esophagus, and now we're moving to the stomach. The primary functions of the stomach are motility. It does peristalsis, secretions, many, many secretions. There are multiple specialized cells within the stomach that secrete hydrochloric acid, enzymes like pepsinogen and gastric lipase, and also hormones like gastrin and histamine. There are also mucus cells that secrete an alkaline mucus protecting the lining of the stomach. And there's another important function of the stomach, which is to secrete something called intrinsic factor involved in vitamin B12 absorption later on in the tract. The stomach can do a small amount of carbohydrate, protein, and fat digestion. So with the pepsinogen, it can digest a little bit of protein. With the gastric lipase, it can digest a little bit of fat. And with the salivary amylase that came down from the mouth and lands in the stomach, it can also do a little bit of digestion of carbohydrates. But the primary site of digestion, despite the fact that we always refer to our stomachs being upset when we have digestive issues, the primary function of the stomach is not digestion. It's actually storage. The food is going to be swallowed down through the oral cavity, pharynx, and esophagus, and it's going to reach the stomach, where the stomach is going to mix the food with the gastric juices and store it until it's released into the small intestine in small amounts for the small intestine to do its work. The stomach also doesn't do nutrient absorption. The stomach can absorb aspirin and alcohol, but it doesn't do primary nutrient absorption like the small intestine. So here's the anatomy of the stomach. There's different regions of the stomach that are important, both anatomically and clinically. So here we have the tube or the esophagus coming in to bring the food into the stomach. The sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach is the gastroesophageal sphincter, which is just near the diaphragm and very close to the heart. So it's also called the cardiac sphincter. Then we have a little upper portion bump of the stomach. That bump is called the fundus of the stomach. Just below the gastroesophageal sphincter is the cardia portion of the stomach. And then we move down into the main body, also called the oxyntic mucosa of the stomach. As we move towards the end of the stomach, close to the small intestine, we reach the pylorus of the stomach. The pylorus is that region right before you get to the final sphincter of the stomach, closing the stomach off to the small intestine, and that's the pyloric sphincter. The fundus and the body are portions of the stomach that contain mucus cells, and the body contains the chief cells, the parietal cells, the enterochromaffin-like cells we're going to talk about. The pylorus, or the antrum region of the stomach, is more funnel-shaped and continuous with the small intestine through the pyloric sphincter. It contains primarily the G cells and the D cells we're going to talk about with respect to secretion of the stomach. As I said in the summary slide, the primary function of the stomach is to store large contents of partially digested food. Once that bolus of food reaches the stomach and mixes with the gastric juices, it's called the chyme. We have folds in the stomach that allow the stomach to expand to a large space. An empty stomach has about 50 mils of fluid. 
A full stomach can be up to a liter before it's distended and uncomfortable. Of course, that varies across individuals and with body size. But think about that. It can go from 50 milliliters all the way up to a liter of volume. That's a huge amount of storage possible in the stomach. The pyloric sphincter tightens at the end of the stomach. It doesn't fully close. It always has a tiny bit of opening, releasing contents into the small intestine, but the size of the pyloric sphincter can be contracted or relaxed to allow more or less of the stomach contents released to the small intestine. And then as the stomach contracts, it can push food into the small intestine to be processed. Let's look at the motility of the stomach. So the motility of the stomach is regulated by many factors, both neural and hormonal. When we see increased motility, that's due to gastrin and motilin hormones. And when we see neural increased motility, that's going to be parasympathetic through the vagus nerve. A decrease in motility of the stomach is through the hormones secretin and cholecystokinin. And a decreased motility neural through the stomach is going to be sympathetic activity increase. The rate of gastric emptying or the movement of contents into the duodenum is increased with other signals as well. The food volume, the pressure and peristaltic waves within the stomach, and also hypoglycemia. Think about it. If we have low sugar in the blood, then the stomach is going to get a signal to say, increase the food being moved into the small intestine. We need to process more so we can raise our blood sugar. Hyperglycemia, on the other hand, decreases gastric emptying, slowing down the food entering the small intestine to give the small intestine more time to process. Motility or gastric emptying is also decreased with solid foods and fats or non-isotonic solutions, both hyper and hypo, that signal to the stomach that it needs more time to process. Secretion from the stomach is unique. And yes, I'm sorry, you do need to know these different cells. They're really important clinically and also with respect to medications. So the stomach mucosa doesn't contain villi like the small intestine does. Instead, it contains what we call gastric pits. So the difference I say is if you're walking along the mucosa of the small intestine, you're gonna to have to walk up all these hills of villi and all that extra surface area. If you're walking along the surface of the stomach, you fall down into the pits. So yes, they both look like they have curvy surface area, but the stomach moves down into pits whereas the small intestine moves up into the villi. So these gastric pits with gastric glands are very important for containing the secretory cells. We have mucus cells, chief cells, parietal cells, enterochromaffin-like or ECL cells, G cells, and D cells or delta cells. All of those are pictured here in this diagram. I don't need you to memorize what they look like, but we do want you to know their functions. Here's a chart that lists the cells, their secretions, what stimulates those secretions, and the function of those secretions. Take a minute to pause here and read through this chart so you can see the different functions of each of these cells. I want to highlight a few key points here for secretion. Stomach acid secretion is very important. Stomach acid is hydrochloric acid or HCl. It has many important roles in the stomach. It breaks down fibrous foods more mechanically. It's not an enzymatic breakdown, it's an acidic breakdown. It's antibacterial. It can break down pathogens that enter through the GI tract. And it also converts one of the enzymes in the stomach, pepsinogen, into pepsin. That's a protein breaking down enzyme. 
Hydrochloric acid is secreted by the parietal cells. Here's the basic pathway that leads to that secretion. First, the vagus nerve releases acetylcholine, stimulating G cells, which release a hormone called gastrin. Gastrin then activates ECL cells. The ECL cells release histamine. Histamine then binds to the H2 receptors on the parietal cells, which activates the parietal cells to secrete hydrochloric acid. So stomach acid secretion is stimulated by gastrin, by histamine, and by activity of the parietal cells. It's inhibited by prostaglandins, somatostatin, cholecystokinin and secretin hormones, which we'll talk about when we talk about the small intestine, and some other hormonal factors, GLP-1 and ANP. Clinically, the knowledge that histamine and H2 receptors activate parietal cell acid stimulation is very important for management of conditions where we see excessive acid secretion or the potential for acid to damage the lining of the stomach. So think here about peptic ulcers. We can block histamine activity by blocking the H2 receptors. We can also block the parietal cell secretion with medications that block proton pumps or the actual secretion of the acid from the parietal cells into the lumen. The role of prostaglandins is important to understand when we think about the risk factors of medications like NSAIDs. When NSAIDs block prostaglandins, they're also blocking the protection of prostaglandins against stomach acid secretion. Mucus secretion is also important in the stomach. Because the pH of the stomach is very low, close to something like 1.5, we need to have a mucosal barrier that protects the lining of the stomach from the acid and from the enzymes, especially pepsin, from auto-digesting the stomach lining. This mucus barrier is secreted by mucus neck cells within the gastric pit. They're stimulated by prostaglandins and nitric oxide. Finally, another important secretion from the stomach is intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is required for the absorption of vitamin B12. It's produced by parietal cells and it combines with vitamin B12 as that vitamin is now moving through the digestive tract. Intrinsic factor and vitamin B12 then will allow that B12 to be absorbed later down through the ileum, the last portion of the small intestine. Lack of B12 can result in a specific form of anemia called pernicious anemia because B12 is required for the production of red blood cells. If we were in class, I would have you all now sit with your partners and review the secretions of the stomach. So I'm asking you either independently or with your group members now to do this activity. Review the secretions of the stomach. Draw the stomach lining. Include the mucus barrier and the acid and enzyme layers. Think about the source and the function of each of the secretions that contributes to those layers. We will later on this week talk about peptic ulcers and the view of the secretions of the stomach is going to help us understand when we have dysfunction of the stomach, for example, with peptic ulcers. Okay, take a minute to do this with your partners and then we are done with the stomach lecture.